I wanted to just spend a few minutes um, going through some of the things which I think are quite interesting um, outputs, interesting ideas which have come out of SAFE, which I think we can claim legitimately are SAFE specific stuff we've learned about forests. Um, so it's, it's brief on anything, but trying to give the big picture things which I, when I think about our outputs and our science, um, things which we've achieved. One, diversity. We've had so many people coming, looking at so many different taxa over the last years that we're, we've found a vast number of things. And this is rough estimates of how many species we've been picking up in logged forests. So diversity of logged forests, I think, is something we've done a really good job of quantifying. Somewhere over 4,000 species, I think. Um, as you'd expect, expect beetles and trees uh, dominate, but also quite a large number of vertebrates. So across everyone's data, and this isn't complete, um, there is a really high diversity in logged forest. There's also, of course, the oil palm aspect to diversity. Um, and so this figure is comparing, for each taxon, it's comparing how many species we've seen in forest with how many species we've seen in oil palm. Um, it's always negative, of course, because there's fewer species in oil palm. Um, what I think is surprising, though, is the magnitude of the species list that we've found in oil palm. Um, I'm sure many of you realize it's, it's so easy to ignore the oil palm side of it. We're doing an oil palm study. We're looking at fragments in oil palm, hopefully. Um, but a lot of people don't want to go out and look in the oil palm. And there's an assumption that there's nothing there. I think so far the species list from oil palm is about four or 500 species, which um, they're not always going to be the same species as we find in forests. It's not always good news. A lot of the species are just vagrants going through and stuff. Um, but it is an important set of information to know just what is out there. And I think we've made a really big contribution on that front um, across research groups. Um, something which is showing up for insect taxa, Mike Boyle's going to talk a little bit about this later on. I'm going to steal his thunder. <laughs> um, but physiology is, really seems to be driving changes in insect community composition. So can you tolerate it in hot conditions? And if you can, then you're more likely to increase in abundance in an oil palm plantation. If you can't, you're going to decrease. So a really key species level trait, which we're, we're seeing it um, work on ants. This is data for ants. Um, we're seeing it on mosquitoes. It sounds like something similar for the dung beetles is going on, um, termites and so on. Basically, the groups we've been looking at are showing this this trend that physiology is really underpinning species ability to persist uh, in these modified habitats. Um, diversity. So gamma diversity is a function of alpha and beta diversity. There's not that many places in the world that emphasize the beta diversity. And if I take a broad swipe of the literature, what we routinely see uh, conclusions about gamma diversity which come from alpha diversity studies. The beta part tends to get ignored. Um, what we've been finding, um, this is data from beetles by Adam Sharp, is that the logging is changing that pattern of alpha and beta diversity. So the top slides here are alpha diversity against above ground biomass. So you've got oil palm here, slightly separated, and then you've got heavily logged forest through to primary forest. There's a bit of variation taxon to taxon, depending which family or which group of beetles you're looking at. But the overall trend is that primary forest has higher alpha diversity than logged forest. But it's exactly the opposite for beta diversity. So the logged forests uh, tend to have higher diversity, higher beta diversity than the primary forest. So you've got this real change in the way animals are distributed across space. And what we're seeing is that beta diversity can actually offset the loss of alpha diversity. Um, and so for a lot of, for the taxa we've been working with, it looks like there's actually no real change in gamma diversity of a logged forest compared to a primary forest. It's just there's an artifact of emphasizing alpha diversity if you incorporate beta diversity 
the species are still out there. Um, this is Ollie Wern's data for mammals, again thinking about beta diversity signal. There's a real difference between small mammals and large mammals. So in a primary forest, very small spatial scales, there's significant turnover. So if I go from here to the end of the room, you find slightly different set of small mammals. But at large scales, if you go a kilometer down the road or whatever, you find a repeating set of the stuff you've already <laughs> seen here. It's the opposite for large mammals in primary forest. You go a long way away, you're likely to find new and interesting species. This pattern is exactly reversed in the logged forest, um, where small mammal communities um, are changing over much larger spatial scales. Large mammals um, suddenly become randomly distributed over, over large scales. Um, that's all to do with the, the modification of the environment and how different species perceive their environment. So what we think is going on is small mammals in a logged forest are really impacted by small scale things. You've got um, small clearances, you've got lots of roads and road effects, you've got different logging coops which have logged more or less heavily and so on. And these small habitat structures we think are Im impacting the distribution of small mammals. But for big things, the forest is essentially homogenized. It's now a Macaranga fest. So going far away doesn't encounter a new type of habitat or a new type of food resource or something like that. Um, so something, if you look at these two patterns in conjunction, beetles and small mammals are really going up in their beta diversity in log forest systems. The exception to this trend seems to be large mammals because of the spatial scales over which they're aggregating resources. Um, it's been quite a lot of work on topics around resilience. Um, there's been a lot of El Nino work. So this is Louise Ashton's science paper from a month or two ago, uh, looking at what termites are doing in the forest. This was primary forest. So they went from normal conditions to a drought condition termites became more active. It's not clear that they were more abundant. It seems like it was just more active and doing more stuff, which had three impacts on the system. So it, it meant leaf litter was decomposing faster, the soils were moister and nutrients were still moving around. And those three effects together had a strong impact on whether seedlings were going to survive through the El Nino or not. It's a really clear case of how invertebrates are really underpinning the resilience of the forest to, um, to a drought event. A uh, paper from four or five years ago which pulled together a lot of data sets as well um, showed that some of the basic forest processes, so here de leaf decomposition, seed disturbance and removal and invertebrate predation, they're all happening more or less the same speed in primary forest as they are in logged forest, uh, which is good news. So the forest processes are still going on, which means the forest should look after itself. What we went on to show in there, though, is that in the primary forest, a lot of these jobs are being picked up by invertebrates, and you go into logged forest, invertebrates are doing much less of these jobs, and you're starting to see vertebrates pick up some of them. Um, so there's a bit of a, a change in who's driving the forest ecosystem. Uh, in logged forests, which has a lot to do with changes in abundance and biomass and composition in the, in the logged forest, which is something I think Yedvind is going to mention stuff uh, about mammals on that. Uh, the next step, so where are we going? Um, there's been 80, 90 papers published out of SAFE so far and my guess is all of you are sitting on new papers as well, which are in the pipeline at various stages. Where I see SAFE going is trying to integrate it. So we have a paper on mammal diversity across spatial scales. We have paper on beetles doing that. We have papers on stability or resilience or these, these semi-isolated components of the system. There's heaps of papers on that. What I want to try and push towards is integrating all of that information um, and trying to link all of those data. Um, 
It would also be nice to have an oil palm plantation, which has been promised for 10 years. Um, and the politics of that seem to get messier by the day, um, don't they? <laughs> uh, we're down to about one signature needed, apparently. Um, we have been very good, I think, at coordinating people's work across space. Um, we have fairly standard central sampling designs, which don't work for everyone and haven't worked for everyone, but for the majority, the large majority of people out there, they have been collecting data at more or less the same set of locations, which puts us in a good position to start thinking about how we tie these data sets together. Um, and lots and lots of people, of course, have been involved. Um, I'm not gonna force you to look at everyone, um, but I, I'm not sure what our list of participants is up to, four, 500 people, something like that, have been involved more or less heavily at SAFE. So it's really, um, it's really encompassing a lot of people, which lets us think very strongly about the next steps, pulling all these data together, uh, which David is gonna talk about in a moment. Any questions? Thank you.